Yeah, that's okay because I am used to talk loudly because I'm a professor of agribusiness management uh, in my university for nearly 25 years. And, but presently I am not in my university. Uh, I'm the vice chancellor of the completely different university, uh, University of the Visual and Performing Arts. Uh, I'm, I'm now with the dancers, musicians, painters and uh, uh, sculptors. These are the people I'm working as administrator. Uh, this research I have conducted uh, in 2019, uh, three years back with my students uh, who are following uh, agricultural uh, tourism, agritourism. Yeah, uh, you can see in the map, uh, this is a tiny country uh, at the end of the Indian subcontinent, the South Asia. Uh, the size of the country is 65,000 square kilometers or 25,000 square miles approximately. And population is uh, 22 million. So this is uh, the map of Sri Lanka. You can see uh, the greenish area is uh, terrains and mid of the country are the mountains. Uh, the mountains goes up to uh, 7,000 uh, feet. Uh, so where the tea plantations are mainly located, but don't think that tea is grown only in the mountains. Uh, now in the terrains also, in the southern part of the country, there are uh, tea plantains, which we call low country grown tea, mainly uh, uh, aimed for the uh, Middle East, Arabic countries. And you can see main agroclimatic zones in Sri Lanka. Uh, the yellow is dry zone. Uh, other, the, the gray one is intermediate zone. And the green one is the wet zone where we have the highest rain falls. And these days I got to know from the internet, uh, there's floods. They are expecting floods. Uh, and it is good for us because uh, we are in a problem of power generation. Uh, so because of the floods, <laughs> we have uh, filled with these uh, uh, power generation stations. So, so what is the background information of the agrotourism? Uh, agrotourism has been considered as booming subsector of tourism and get more attraction in developing countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia. However, compared to other countries in these two regions, Sri Lanka has paid less attention towards the development of agritourism sector. Even though number of isolated researchers, academics and farmers have taken interest and effort to promote agritourism among small and medium scale farmers. Mainly in Sri Lanka, uh, we are considering on tea tourism. Uh, there are a lot of uh, tea tourist, uh, tea tourism industry uh, in the mountainous area. And uh, I have seen recently some of the old tea factories were converted into luxury hotels, uh, which were located inside in the tea plantation. And tea tours and tea tastings, uh, because uh, if you want to go for a tea tour, you have to go in the midnight after nine o'clock in the evening, because uh, upcountry tea is produced mainly in the nights, not in the daytime. An objective of this study, the study will address the information gap on the factors affecting the willingness of farmers in adoption of agritourism in Sri Lanka. And this would help linking more farmers from 
traditional agriculture to the agritourism farms by providing and improving those factors to obtain maximum benefits of agritourism and uplift the rural livelihood in the sustainable manner. Apart from that, uh, Sri Lanka is one of the uh, tourist destination in Asia. Uh, these days uh, we are having the, the highest number of tourists came to Sri Lanka in 2018, after the end in the war, civil war in 2929. Uh, there were about 5 million uh, tourists came to Sri Lanka. Uh, but now it had been declined due to pandemic situation. And these days, since March this year, uh, we are in a uh, economic crisis uh, because of the mismanagement by the, the, the expelled president. We had to expel the president a couple of months back and he has flew away. Uh, and we had appointed a new president through the parliament uh, because of that uh, uh, wrong decisions in the management and economic management. Uh, so again, we have to make a boom in the tourism industry. So we have to make some diversification of the tourism industry, mainly to attract the tourists uh, within the, uh, the coming season. Uh, coming is a season from September onwards, the tourist season in Sri Lanka. And specific objects, objectives are to identify the current socioeconomic and farming situation, in the farmers in mountainous region in Sri Lanka, to find out the factors affecting adoption of agritourism by farmers in mountainous region in Sri Lanka, to provide recommendations to decision makers to attract farmers in mountainous region in Sri Lanka to achieve sustainable rural development by adopting agritourism. I have taken the mountainous area mainly in this study. So this is the area we have done uh, this uh, research. So you can see, uh, they are the famous Nuvarelia, uh, which we called uh, Little England because uh, the architecture uh, of the uh, buildings in this area, and this is the highest location. And the temperature is around uh, 10 centigrades to 22 centigrades throughout the year in this region. Uh, not hot and not very cold, very mild weather. Uh, so it is attracted by the uh, tourist. And that time during the British colonial era, uh, a lot of uh, British planters and British uh, uh, administrators were uh, having vacation in this region. An objective of farming of the people in this area by the study, uh, both consumption of and com commercial, commercial, and consumption. And size of the farm of the respondents. It's very tiny lands, apart from the big plant, big tea plantations. Tea plantations are very big, but the small farmers own uh, less than five uh, hectares, uh, five, uh, around five hectares. And uh, you can see that 42% are areas are less than uh, 0.5 hectares, means uh, less than one acre around one acre. And types of crop cultivators, uh, cultivated paddy, paddy and vegetables, paddy and other, vegetables only, vegetables and fruits other. Because I have not taken tea. Tea has been grown by the big plantations in this area. And irrigation methods use only rainwater, government irrigation canals, well, natural water, both rain and, rain and irrigational water. Involvement of the younger generation in agriculture. 44% uh, are not willing to involve in agriculture because all of them are looking for white collar jobs, managers and et cetera, et cetera. And involvement of the younger generation in agritourism. 44% the they don't know what is agritourism, no idea. And 46%, yes, they are, because while it is tourism, they think that it is some kind of uh, attractive job. Uh, they are willing to uh, participate if they will be educated in agritourism. 
farmers' knowledge uh, on methods to earn extra income from farm. Uh, they don't have any idea. And but 25, uh, 31%, 45%, they have idea how to get some extra income from the farm. Knowledge on types of methods to earn extra income. You can see 38% selling farm products near farm. So that is uh, what they are expecting to do because majority of them are vegetable farmers in the mountainous area. The, the major uh, vegetable production area in the country is this mountainous area apart from tea. Uh, mainly potatoes and other vegetables like cabbage, carrots, leeks, rab uh, radish, and these uh, upcountry grown. Uh, we have two types of vegetables. One is low country grown tree uh, vegetables and upcountry grown vegetables. Upcountry grown vegetables are mainly coming from this area and they are selling uh, in the road sites and getting some extra income uh, other than they are selling it to the uh, big markets. Behavior of the agritourism non adoption adopting farmers. Knowing agritourism and like to learn about, actually 44% people, they are willing to learn about the agritourism. Opportunities for agritourism. So you can see area of area is beautiful and attractive. This is the main feature we can sell apart from the uh, other on-farm activities, because this area is, if you can see, uh, very beautiful, very greenish, and also uh, waterfalls are there, uh, very greenish, and flora and fauna is very rich in, the, in this mountainous area. And you can experience uh, very uh, attractive and uh, train uh, tours in this area, which were built by the, uh, during the British era, uh, and windy roads in the uh, rail tracks. A uh, lot of things. And other thing is situation of places which attracts tourists in the area, but which I told you, a uh, lot of uh, uh, mountainous, ma mountain hiking you can do, uh, and also a very attractive, uh, beautiful nature, which is attracted by the tourist. That's for agri-tourism. Roads in the area are poor quality, but uh, uh, at present it is, uh, Bet far better, but if it is uh, rainy seasons, there's a danger, danger that can be uh, earth slips and uh, suddenly all the roads get closed because of the mountainous area. And lack of knowledge on agritourism, lack of monetary facilities for farm development, lack of monetary facilities for accommodation development in the farm, infrastructure, infrastructure facilities are poor in the area, Lack of knowledge in attracting visitors to the farm. Suggest, suggestions from farmers to develop agritourism in the area. The number two, uh, two the more knowledge on agritourism. Because they are, this is a new uh, thing that we have to introduce to them. So therefore it should be educated. And again, creating a method to attract visitors to farm by the sponsorship in the government. Uh, this is one very bad experience in these uh, countries because you know that, that uh, still the people in the country, farmers especially, they are thinking they need subsidies from the government. Uh, that is a very bad approach from the uh, colonial era up to now. Farmers are all farmers always they are looking for subsidies for fertilizer for seeds in the this end and that end also. This end means from the inputs and the uh, other end also. And conclusions probably of the farmers' participation in agritourism is significantly influenced by the education level of the farmers. Accordingly, farmers with higher education levels are more likely to adopt the agritourism practices. Lack of female participation with regards to the agritourism adoption. Cultural barriers and attitudes of the male dominant society may be the reason of this observation. 
as a developing nation in the 21st country century, Sri Lanka needs to focus on empowering women to enhance their capabilities in decision making on new trends of the world. The knowledge in information technology and the English language, which helps to adopt novel techniques such as agritourism, are increasing with the education level. This may be the reason in showing increasing trend in farming and adopting agritourism with education level. Uh, even though uh, other economical factors are uh, less, uh, the socio social factors and educational factors are high because 99% of the people are literate. Uh, especially majority of the people can speak in English and their IT uh, literacy also high. And with this one, I'll like to conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to know or the difference between age groups and gender regarding the willingness of their participation in tea tourism. And I also want to know whether there was a difference between different castes or ethnic groups. Thank you. Yeah, mainly tea tourism is uh, operated by, not by the farmers, by the plantation companies, uh, not by the individual small farmers. Uh, this is uh, operated by uh, big plantation companies. Uh, therefore, I can't answer you at what is the gender. This is this, uh, this, uh, uh, entity-wise uh, operation. And other thing is, uh, this area um, mainly uh, two types, two, two ethnic, ethnic, ethnic groups are there. One are the uh, Sinhalese, other one is the Tamils, Indian Tamils, who were brought from South India to work in the tea plantations by the British. So, but now they are the citizens in the country and they are, they are the workforce in the tea plantations. Any other questions? Right, so okay, uh, give me a minute. I have a, written a book on agritourism. I could not bring a lot, I wrote three copies and I have given one to Lisa and there are two copies uh, available. If you want, uh, I can hand one to you. Anyone else has one copy? Thank you. Thank you so much. We're now going to uh, see a presentation about agritourism support indicators for the United States. And this is pre-recorded, but the, um, the whole person who is the professor is online and will be doing a Q&A live. So if you want to get to share my screen. Okay, great. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for tuning into our presentation. So we are currently conducting research for a NIFA-funded project that looks at the agritourism support system in the United States. And uh, as you can see, we have a lot of collaborators on this project, and I'd like to um, acknowledge them as well. Um, all right, let's get started. So agritourism can be found across the United States, as you know. So I hope you like maps. I have a lot of them. This map shows the share of agritourism revenue with numbers from the 2007 census. That means the percentage of agritourism income from total agriculture income in a county. The uh, census definition is fairly limited, though, and it's defined as income from agritourism and recreational services such as farm tours, hay rides, hunting, fishing, and so on. So they don't account for the type of agritourism that is conducted by these operators. Um, so, for example, we can see that there is a high concentration in Texas, 
Um, and based on survey work, we know that there is a lot of hunting down there, so that counts as agritourism. But the type of agritourism in Texas is uh, very different from what uh, we see in the Northeast, where we have more um, events and farm dinners and farm tours and so on. So, and I'd also like to show you the change over the last decade. So I'm gonna go to the 2017 map. So this is the share of agritourism with the uh, 2017 census number. Um, you can see a trend. Uh, so one trend is that agritourism activity is increasingly moving towards the coast. We can see counties with deeper colors up here in the Northeast. And uh, we also see that Arizona and New Mexico and overall the West Coast are catching up. So I'm gonna go back to the 2007 map and now to the 2017 map, so you can really appreciate the change in colors. So uh, we talk a lot about how agritourism demand is growing in the United States and uh, the limited data uh, we have does show that more and more farmers are offering agritourism. But according to the U.S. census definition of agritourism, still less than 1.5% of farms in the United States offer it. and. Uh, I'm very excited about the next census results, uh, which I assume will show a bigger jump in the numbers because of the uh, impact of the pandemic and the changes in consumer demand for outdoor and agritourism activities. So what is causing these regional concentrations of agritourism? Uh, what are they doing over there? So. We investigated that further with a local spatial autocorrelation statistic called Smorens uh, I. And uh, here we have the maps of clusters of agritourism in 2012 and 2017 based on the local Moran's eye. So the two largest high, high clusters in red are in the Midwest region and Montana and Texas. And another relatively large one appears in the Northeast region um, that's closer to New York City. Um, so this is expected based on the previous maps, but you can also see the cold spots here. So counties that have low agritourism and so do the counties surrounding them. A similar 2012 map uh, was published in a publication um, from uh, Van Zandt in 2018. Um, and they also looked uh, what causes these hot and cold clusters. And they found that the probability of a county being a hotspot is influenced by <clears throat> the, excuse me, uh, the county, uh, if the county has outdoor attractions, uh, if it has good travel infrastructure and uh, rurality. Um, in comparison, our 2017 map shows some uh, expansion of the high high clusters uh, near New York City and Wyoming and Colorado. So stuff is happening. So we know that so-called place-based factors play a huge role, but based on previous survey work, we also know that the entrepreneurial support system is really important for farmers to start or expand their agritourism uh, options or operations. Um, so based on previous qualitative work, we found that across the United States, and here are just some examples, operators have strong concerns regarding regulations and they lack support from their towns, local organizations and neighbors because of the um, multiple reasons really. Um, so in the beginning we saw it was the limited understanding of what agritourism means to farmers and their rural communities. And in many cases there was no system There's also um, the QR code that links to fact sheets. So this is how our project got started. And we were wondering what is included in an effective support system and how we can make it stronger. And uh, <clears throat> we asked 33 agritourism experts, so extension specialists, leaders of agritourism associations, lawyers, researchers, and
So um, McGee's paper from 2007 looked at the needs and obstacles of agritourism providers, um, DMOs, so destination marketing organizations, and the visitors, the agritourists. And uh, she developed a model to address these three stakeholder groups' motivations and needs for participating in an agritourism system. So we thought we need to go way beyond that. And uh, also things have changed a lot since 2007. And now more agencies at all geographical levels are interested in agritourism development and also in regulating it. And uh, Stam and uh, Van de Ven show that uh, the many parts and strong interrelationships um, among the ecosystem elements. Um, and here's what we developed uh, by taking our experts' answers and different ecosystem element frameworks into consideration. So in the middle, we have the output, a strong agritourism entrepreneurship. At the bottom, we have elements that influence the actors such as place-based factors, culture, and uh, formal institutions, which are uh, the broad rules of the game. Um, all of the components are interdependent. I hope that is clear by the many thrilling arrows we put in there. Uh, starting at the top, we have marketing, where a lot of municipal associations now start to support agritourism. This depends heavily on county-based factors, for example, how active the business bureau is or if the destination marketing organization, so the tourism bureau, is actively promoting agritourism for that county. Um, and then we also have state tourism departments, and uh, they were traditionally tasked with marketing and promoting tourism in their state. So these departments promote all types of tourism initiatives, um, and we reviewed uh, the activities of state tourism departments and found that 20 or 50 states directly promote agritourism and five state tourism departments indirectly promote it um, through site searches. And uh, there has been a lot of research on agritourism demand in general and the impact on agriculture literacy. This is just starting. Um, but there is a lack of research about regional preferences and characteristics and how they can help to increase demand for local visitors, again, tourists, and then institutions uh, such as uh, schools for school tours and so on. And I'm now going to talk about the regulatory environment because here we can highlight how there is not a level playing field for agritourism operators. So in the United States, agritourism regulations are usually enacted at the state, county or municipal levels rather than the national level. And uh, the legal definition of agritourism is important because Without an official definition, um, agritourism operators don't know who's even considered an agritourism operator, uh, what regulations or zoning rules to follow, or what taxes to apply to their operation. So generally, the definition is important because it becomes a standard um, in other contexts, like the interpretation of zoning ordinances. So the last time we checked, um, 11 states do not have an agritourism um, definition. This map shows the state of liability statutes across the United States. Um, these uh, limit uh, legal liability for farms providing agritourism. So, uh, for example, they require um, warning signs posted on the property or the signing of waivers by visitors. And the first states uh, that have put these in place were Kansas and Kentucky, and just more recently, um, Pennsylvania, uh, Vermont, and um, Iowa. But um, so this also doesn't provide really a clear cut picture. For example, some states that passed statutes with the definition didn't pass the liability portion of the statute for several years, or in the case of Tennessee, they passed their liability statute with the agritourism definition in 2009, but then again, they made a lot of changes to the liability language in 2020. <clears throat> so we have a lot of moving parts here. And now I wanna highlight um, research and support. Uh, there are a number of different funding opportunities for agritourism operations. 
um, at the local level and at the state level, but I wanted to highlight funding for research and extension programming. And um, agritourism is really a, in comparison to a lot of other research areas, it's a novel research and extension area. And uh, funding at the federal level has started about 25 years ago. Um, so since uh, 1997, um, the uh, Sustainable um, Agriculture Research and Education Program, uh, sorry, um, has funded 18 projects nationally, with most of the funding going to the southern region and the northeast. And uh, the uh, risk management education centers have funded 27 projects with 50% uh, of the funding going to the Western United States. So it all depends on how active the extension services and uh, researchers are in these regions. Um, and then we also have bigger projects that are funded by the USDA's National Institute for Food and Agriculture. They funded uh, about 11 projects uh, with a total value of uh, 2.5 million. Um, so there are research and extension projects. And uh, so these are, and if you don't have an extension specialist um, and researchers applying for funding in these uh, in these regions, um, the regions entrepreneurs won't benefit, and this is especially true for the um, extension work. So we also had a look at um, where the extension programs are in the United States and if they're active. So we did a web search and ask extension services in each state if they have an active extension program. And we can say that most states either have an extension program or starting one. In our recent paper and our expert survey, we find that there is a need to start collaborating across extension services and community partners um, and agritourism associations as to, well, not to repeat efforts and really to learn from each other and work towards a more level playing field that will address regional and local issues by learning from other local, state, and federal levels. So here are our next steps. We are currently working on finalizing a support system overview at the state level, which will be available soon uh, so that we see what is out there at the state level. And then uh, we are holding um, a webinar in September through the National Extension Tourism Network that is led by my colleague uh, Lisa Chase from the University of Vermont. We hope that this will be the first step to developing a national toolkit of resources and tools for agritourism programming. So if you can, and if you're interested, please join us on September 15th. We are also planning to send out um, another uh, producer survey and asking them about the regulatory hurdles they're experiencing and what they're looking for in an effective support system. We will send out this survey in uh, February 2023. So if you are an agriculture producer and you get our survey, we would highly appreciate it if you can fill it out because it will greatly inform our research efforts. And this is the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm from Romania, and uh, I'm uh, very impressed uh, of the invest of the program of the United States uh, investing in trees. My question is: these funds coming for farmers to create agritourist uh, premises is for starting from zero, or just to improve some existing location to modernize to adapt the structure to the new? goal of the farm? This no, is I, the question. The money are from zero or just to improve something? Thank you. So the funding I was talking about specifically was uh, for research and extension. So they're funneled from the, from the federal government and from the state. Um, and they are at, uh, at different levels, really. OK. Can you hear me? Oh, 
I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yay, you can hear me. Can you also see me? Yes. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about, again, about the funding. So um, the funding gets funneled down from, uh, from, the, from the government and the state budgets, and it really, um, it really depends on the program. Um, I'm just saying, uh, like, for example, here in, in Center County in Pennsylvania, we, we put out a program and um, we can give it to farms that are just starting out or we're giving to farms that want to diversify. So it really depends on the situation. And the funding I was talking about um, was going to research and extension. So some of it goes to peer research, some of the stuff I was presenting today, and some of the survey work that um, that Lisa Chase, for example, was, was talking about or, or will talk about, and uh, a lot of other funding then goes for more practical projects. But it all depends on the funding program. I hope that answers your question, which essentially is it all depends. Hello, Claudia. Uh, this is Dave Lemie from South Carolina, um, currently in Vermont. Um, and I, I recognize that scene behind you. I've seen that many times in Zoom calls with you in the past. Um, I know you've been involved in the national and now some of the international survey work that we're doing um, that we started back in 2019 here. Just the basic um, uh, fun foundations of the agritourism operators across the country and now this exploring kind of what are the supports that they need um, under this project would seem to me um, there's questions in this that perhaps people hear from other countries like our, our uh, the person from Romania who just spoke might be interested in exploring in their context as well and I'm wondering is there is there an interest is there a, an openness to say bringing some of those questions from the from the survey that you used in the United States into other international contexts to apply in other countries on your part. I agree. Yeah, I definitely think that this is a question we should investigate further, like how, how, how much money is spent and how does this, and it should be probably uh, the share of money that is spent on agritourism in comparison to all these subsidies and, and, and other monies that are provided to farmers. So I agree. Can you still hear me? Yes, Claudia. All right. Hi. Hi, Todd Coleman. I have a question. It relates to the limitations of the study. And I hate to bring that up because it was a great study. But when you say that Texas is one of the strongest agritourism uh, states and it includes hunting and other recreational activities, I'm wondering, did your group think of that as a limitation or are we adding hunting and fishing and hiking and mountain biking to the definition of agritourism? Thank you. I could talk about that for hours now. Okay, so what we can what we can analyze really the data we have. Uh, the only data that we have is from the agriculture census, and they include hunting under agritourism, as I've mentioned. So when you when you remember the maps I showed. Um, this was data from the from the agriculture census in the United States, and they include hunting. So what is missing and some of the suggestions we are making is why don't we ask farmers what type of agritourism they're conducting so we can read so we actually know what is happening across the country and what kind of um, challenges they're facing and what kind of uh, support can we provide. And there's also the paper that I mentioned is a new paper talking about agritourism in the United States. Um, you can ask Lisa Chase, who's in the room, and she can give you the reference for that. So that will talk a lot about the, the issues we have with the data. So it's all public data we rely on. Uh, hi, Courtney Llewellyn from Louisiana. Um, hi. I was curious, in uh, as people are going around and giving input for the 2023 Farm Bill, has there been a push to reform or revise that definition of agritourism to make hunting a separate thing? Have you heard anything about that? And if so, um, you know, should people be reaching out through extension 
through, you know, um, their FSA office, like who should they be talking to, to try and fix that definition? You know what? I don't know. And the problem actually is that the census keeps changing definitions and classifications. Um, so for example, the, the operators now, we know that now we have more, more female farmers in the United States, but then the problem is when they're changing it and the same happens with value added goods as well, the census, they decided to change the definition. Um, while this is great that we are opening up the, the definitions, um, at the same time, that, uh, that brings up a barrier for researchers so we cannot compare to previous years, right? Because now all of a sudden we are capturing different data. So I think we have to be really careful in what we're asking for. And then I don't know how to ask for what we're doing. We're just putting out a lot of research and starting to, to establish a, a, a discussion. And then we just see where, where this is going. But any changes to the census definition should happen very carefully and very gradually. And we should make sure that we can still um, you know, research the, the development over the year. Thank, thank you so much. We appreciate Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I am really enjoying these presentations. And I'm, I think that I will do my best, but that's very hard. I, I, it's okay if they don't capture my face. Um, so uh, we have been talking about what are the many values of agritourism. And I want to focus on two in particular. Uh, one is the educational and the marketing. Before, before I start, I'm Carla Barbieri, a professor and extension specialist at North Carolina State University. And even though I am presenting here, there was a big team behind this project. And Dr. Schmidt just talked about uh, the funding that we do have from the federal government. And this project was about uh, that. We were funded by USDA NIFA. If you can help me. Okay, perfect, thank you. So what is the background? And we know that for many years, maybe since the beginning of agritourism, we have heard farmers talking about that they develop agritourism because they want to educate the public, correct? That's their wish. That's uh, our wish as farmers, we want to educate them. We also know that uh, farmers, what they want is stimulate the purchase of local foods because in turn that strengthens the local food system. Now, when we survey and we ask um, visitors to these farms, we know that they want the same thing. They are going to farms because they want to learn about agriculture. They want to reconnect with the local food, food system. And especially they want that their children, their great children, uh, grandchildren and so on, they learn where their food comes from. This is a quote from another study, but I really like because it embodies what we are talking about. Agritourism as a tool to education, to reconnection, uh, reconnecting with agricultural production and to protect our resources, fill the gap there, cultural resources, natural resources, agricultural resources. The question is really, to what extent there is an educational value when we visit a farm? and to what extent we are actually um, fostering or stimulating the purchase of local foods. To answer that question, we develop a study using quasi-experimental design uh, in North Carolina. There's a map of the US, uh, it's painted in red where North Carolina is located, so you kind of have an idea. And in this, far, in this study, it was four years originally extended to five years, and tomorrow is the last day of this study. 
um, what is very cool. We involve families um, and the criteria to involve in them was that at least there was one adult in uh, the visit and at least one child between nine and 13 years old. We also involved seven uh, farms offering agritourism and 12 schools. So how does that aquas experimental design works? When we were in a farm, we had a team there. As soon as the family were entering the farm, we asked them if they wanted to do a survey. If they say yes, they did a survey. We gave them a special wrap to identify them. We allow them to be all the time that they wanted to be, do their visit. And when they were exiting, we survey them again. And that will help us to identify whether there was a gain on the spot after the visit. So um, we have two parts. One is the marketing side of the study. In the marketing part, we uh, only identified families going on um, their week during the weekend uh, to the farms. And the educational pro uh, component, we have what we call three different treatments. That means families going on their own, school visits with the teachers, a virtual experience, and of course, a control group that they didn't have any experience. I just want to clarify that the virtual experience was a gift of COVID. It was not intended, uh, but we have to adapt uh, given that all field trips were canceled. So very quickly, the survey instrument, we, uh, for the children, we asked them several questions about uh, knowledge on agriculture and, um, for the parents, we asked them their intentions to purchase local foods and also the likelihood to increase their family budget to purchase local foods. And for those that want some statistical information, those are the methods that we conducted. Our sample for the kids, you can see that the main thing is that about 50% were uh, white, uh, but they were all distributed kind of uh, nicely distributed ac across all the ages that we wanted. With the parents, I want to highlight a couple of key demographic informations. They were highly educated, very, very highly educated with 36% having a four year degree at the university plus an additional 25 with a postgraduate degree. They also had high income um, and they were young. So, Let's talk about the results on education. Does agritourism increases or not education on children? So let's focus on the first two columns, pre-visit and post-visit. So when we ask before entering the farm, just to have an idea, we ask the typical question of match the food with a crop. For example, ketchup with tomatoes, correct? Uh, and we give them some options. Well, before entering the farm, 71.6% have a correct answer. And after the visit, 75.4. You can see in all the questions, there was an increase of knowledge. That's good. However, when we run the statistical analysis, we see that only three were statistically higher uh, proportion. Now, let's focus on what were those questions. And those questions were related to North Carolinian agriculture. So that means that those were um, elements that they were, they were learning on the farm because they were seeing about North Carolina agriculture. Then we added all the questions, how many questions were correct and so on. And we created an index. The same thing, we saw an increase before going into the farm, they had 4.4 uh, correct answers. After the farm, we're talking about hours after the visit, their knowledge increased to 4.66, okay? And in this case, it was significant different. I also talk about treatments, correct? Different types of agritourism experiences. In, and we wanted to compare whether some sort of agritourism exposure increases more or increases less education. And 
I have to say to our disappointment, um, we found very, very few differences across treatments. We just found that those going with their family, of course, have a better uh, or a more increasing knowledge than those on the control group. And also that type of crop by region. Virtual was higher than the family visits. Finally, sorry, there's um, something wrong going there. Um, when we aggregated the knowledge, we also found again that the virtual experiences were higher than uh, kids going with their family or even kids going with their teachers to the farm. Yeah, I know. Hmm. Um, so moving into the parents, what, what did we find for marketing? What we found also, let's uh, see it in, in, in pre-visit and post-visit. In this case, we measure using a scale, a five-point scale from one very unlikely to five very likely. What we found here again is that there was an increase of intentions uh, to buy local foods using different categories. But in this case, all increases were significantly different. That is major. And I want to focus that the only thing that didn't change was eating at a restaurant offering local foods, okay? So this is something very cool because it's very easy to say, oh yes, sure, I will likely increase. But it's a different question when I ask you how much you are going to pay more for local foods. And that question, we had three different scenarios. Would you be willing to increase your budget by 5% to purchase local food? And we found that yes, the increase after the farm visit was significantly different, but also by 10%. Even though the increase was a little bit less, people or adults were willing to increase their family budget by 20%. So very briefly, what I am presenting here from a state level of data is that folks, agritourism, yes, increases agricultural literacy on children. Second, that it doesn't matter too much the type of agritourism experience that we are offering. For parents, we found that agritourism is an excellent marketing tool to improve intentions to buy and likelihood to increase the family budget to purchase local foods. So before going to what does these results mean for us as agritourism providers or as agencies or nonprofits, extension agents, and so on. I want to mention some limitations of the study. First, COVID. Really, COVID kind of messed it up uh, because we were able to collect data of farm of families going to the farm. And when we were going to collect data, we collected half of the data of children going with their teachers. COVID came all field trips were canceled and we came up with the idea of virtual tours. But that created, even during the virtual tours, a little bit of difficulty asking teachers to be, follow the protocol because they had other priorities on their, on their plate, correct? So, so the time between the pre and the post was not necessarily consistent uh, because of COVID. We also have an unintended sampling bias. We can see that our families were highly educated by the fact that they are going to an agritourism farm is because they already have that idea on their mindset. We have to remember that. And the same with teachers, all the teachers, wonderful teachers that help us and supported during our project is because they are committed to increasing agricultural literacy on their children. Farmer, fun, <laughs> data collection on the farm we struggled because some of these families were three, four hours at the farm and asking them to do a test at the end was like seriously, you know, doing their best, but they were tired and they were halfway saying, you know, I'm tired and so on. So those were the limitations. Now, how this study contributes to our all uh, 
um, agritourism knowledge. First one is confirms education as a public value of agritourism. Also, it is important to recognize or reassure us that we can include agritourism as part of the local food movement, and that is major. Um, future research, we have to do some thematic knowledge. Uh, if a farm is teaching about um, tomatoes, we have to assess the kids about tomatoes, not about apples, correct? Second thing is, and we are in the process of doing that, uh, hopefully we'll publish that soon, control for sociodemographic backgrounds. We want to see whether people with um, parents, let's say, with less education have a greater uh, no, um, gain or so on. And of course, measure actual purchase behavior. Now, what does that mean? Here I have faults from NGOs, I have farmers, I have extension faculty. Please, let's begin to be advocates for agritourism. In the curricula of a school curricula, visiting a museum, it's a mandatory field trips for farm school. Well, let's make visiting a farm also mandatory to reinforce uh, uh, agriculture literacy on elementary schools. Foster uh, farmer to teacher partnerships. We created awesome partnerships because of this project. Uh, farmers um, giving virtual classes to, thank you, virtual classes uh, to kids. Teachers very happy because their children were not bored anymore. So that in turn is going to help to contribute. Managing uh, managerial implications for farmers. Let's enhance, um, I think Mario was talking about that before. Let's enhance interpretation in the farms. We cannot acknowledge, we cannot assume that people know where their food comes from. We have to teach them. Also this morning, we learned how so many kids have never seen dirt, correct? So it is important that we help them um, in that process. And with that also brand, either your community, your state, however the extent you want to do. In North Carolina, we have got to be uh, North Carolina, that we try to use it consistently with all local foods and agritourism too just trying to, uh, to incentivize that brand recognition. With that, uh, thank you very much. And I don't know if you have time for questions. Oh, he says yes, so we do have time for questions. Thank you. There's a little bit of time for questions. If you want, please come up to the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. I have a small questions related to your survey design. Uh, because there are there are many agritourism farms, they are offering different types of services, and you generated. Uh, how did you generate it, the questions related to uh, those farms differently? Thanks very much, Dr. Kumar, for that question. And actually, we put a lot of effort in choosing what farms we wanted to do to avoid some bias. So we started with a sample, I think, of 40 farms um, in North Carolina. Ms. Andy Baggett helped us uh, in her position in the agritourism office at the state level to help us to narrow them or to collect the, the whole sample. From that, we use a series of criteria that will fit the study. One was location, because we were thinking about study um, across the state, it needed to be in the three regions of North Carolina. Second criteria, they needed to be within a radius that teachers could take in field trips to their study. And then we went to what are the criteria that we want to measure to make consistent uh, agritourism. It needed to be farms offering recreation, with educational content, okay? They also need to have a you pick up activity or any type of hands-on activity because that is one of the experiential elements of agritourism. And finally, it needed to have a local store. So the adults did the click with the local foods and whether 
oh yes, oh, this is local food. I thought that local food was, you know, a brand. Uh, so we needed that. Thank you. Sorry. Just one other question on, uh, I guess your research design. Do you think it'd be beneficial if you use a longitudinal study to actually six months or a year afterwards contact the same people to see what their purchase behavior actually happened? Actually, that's a awesome question that I would love to follow up. Um, and that was one of the limitations that I mentioned. One thing, or implications, sorry, for future research. One thing is to ask intentions, even if it's on the spot. Another thing is actually see how much they purchase on the farm and whether they are holding to increase the revenues or in some way, whether they are investing more in purchasing local foods. Yes, thank you. That's the next step. Ask him, not me. Oh, thank you. Um, you say that agritourism is a good channel for promoting local uh, re related food. Do you think that might happen the opposite? Is economically interested the farmer to produce and offer because not always they produce, they might buy to the neighborhood farmers and they pro provide to the customers. So, Thank you, that's a very good question. And that is why uh, we, in this study, we refer to the local food systems um, and agritourism being part of it, because there's a lot of interaction and linkages. It's local foods, it's the neighboring foods, it's the branding on the opposite direction where you are talking to. So I go to agritourism and then I have this farm. I know this farm, there's a branding I'm going to buy, but it's also farms Farms cannot sell everything, at least in our state, they do not produce everything. So usually they have to outsource from other uh, farmers. And the idea is strengthening local foods by outsourcing from the neighbors, correct? Uh, and that includes not only fresh food, but also local um, value added, not only of foods, but also crafts. So it's a very, very large system, craft beverages too. Is there any potential to add maybe a farm to school uh, lunch program with this overall uh, awareness? That will be fantastic. Uh, there, there is that program going on um, and that it's developing in a, into a very strong research area. I am not involved on, on, on that topic itself because it goes a little bit beyond um, what I can physically and mentally uh, do, my team, um, my students think that I'm doing way too much. So, uh, and they actually doing too much. So th there's a limit, but yes, there is um, increasing research line going into that direction, uh, involving and, and closing the loop between uh, teachers, farmers, and especially cafeterias. Actually, there is a conference called Farm to Cafeteria, um, yeah, or something along those lines. So it's growing that research line. Thank you. That's, that's all the time we have now. I thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, folks.